When you've got now the, the LEDU Saturn that just came out, the large format printer, and that printer itself is was five hundred bucks. Did you get one? I didn't get one, and there's a there's a reason why. Is behind me, sitting on the floor, is not a lot of people know about it, but I have the makings and the LCD uh, of four K. It's a four K monochrome LCD display for a twenty three inch screen. So it'll be in a sense not the first. There's another one that's out there, but it's about twenty grand to start. But it'll be the a large format resin printer. So you're are you building that from scratch? Yeah, I'm designing my own printer. Wow, we have to talk about that. <laughs> so, well, that's not actually the craziest one. Is I actually have a manufacturer that wants me to to play with, and I was like, I just don't have anywhere to put it. But it's a ninety three inch. Um, 8K. It's a 93-inch 8K LCD uh, monochrome screen. Wow. What does that thing weigh? Um, like nothing. <laughs> oh, really? Well, they're two millimeters thick because there's no backlight. There's nothing on it, right? I was freaked out to get this screen because you pick it up and you can almost fold it in half. There's nothing to it. All right. And so I'm, I'm looking at it and going, okay, I, what am I going to do with a 93-inch screen? You know, I, I don't have a lab. I need to set up a lab. And then there's other things that come into play. So when it, with a 23 inch screen, you know the suction force when it pulls away. Yeah. With an, with a with our small five inch screens, it could be a couple of pounds, right? That's when what people hear is that pop. When you go to an 8K screen, it's going to be a larger pop because it now the, the poundage increases. A 23 inch screen, you can have up to anywhere between 20 to 50 pounds of pull on the FEP, depending on what it is, right? If it's a really big, massive block thing. And it, it, or on a eight, let's say nine inch screen, it could be like 20 pounds of pull, right? So that's a lot. A 23 inch screen could be 50 pounds of pull. A, ni a 93 inch screen, we're talking, you know, 80 to 100 pounds of suction force. Did you see how Autodesk handled that with their one of their 3D printers that uh, was one of the original resin printers? Yeah, they, they rotated the build plate. Yeah. So that to to keep it from sticking, and then they use some oxygen inhibitor, uh, silicone yeah, or something. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's an oxygen layer. It's called Clip Technology. Um, Carbon uses it where there's a, a kind of like an FPP film that impregnates and has an oxygen layer. Um, and then there's also the one where there's a layer of, in a sense, like an oil, and then the resin lays on top of the oil, and then it basically extracts from there. But the only problem is you can't do solid parts with that. Um, like the Eiffel Tower lattice, you can do that because that's what really works really well. Oh, right. But it doesn't really work well in like 100% solid infill part, which is what the parts I print on. Right. But the whole idea was like, I'm like, okay, if I can take and print 21 of those parts on a five inch by five inch plate, imagine how many of them I can print on a 23 inch plate, right? So I actually figured out is I can print is like 238 parts on a, on a 23 inch plate which means that single print job that still would take me the same like six and a half hours, and that generates me like 1800 bucks every six and a half hours if that thing comes up, right? And I've got some of these guys now that are like, hey, we just want to have these parts on the shelf, right? We don't want to do these one-offs and wait for shipping. We want to order 200 parts and just have it sitting on the shelf if we just need it. Okay, completely possible. The only way to maximize by not having a whole room full of printers is to actually have a larger print surface. So are you building this printer just for you or would it be something you'd be taking into production, you think? I actually have two people that are interested that are like, hey, we want to see it when it's done um, because it's utilizing stuff that's completely different than nobody's done. As an example, most of the printers like the Mars or the Inicubic Photon, the arm is at the back. So if you're looking at it sideways, the build plate would be here and the arm would be here. My printer is the arms are on the side. So there is no arm at the rear. They're, they're connected on the side. There's two arms. The build plate at the top of the, the axis, once it comes up to the top of the print, purposely, actually, there's a servo motors that rotate the build plate 45 degrees for you intentionally. So you don't oh, have to touch it. Nice. So it just comes up, and once it's done, it just rotates and sits there and says, okay, I'm here. I'm waiting. Um, other stuff like um, there's fans that draw air in, that draw cool air in past filters, and then it circulates through the inside 
then passes through filters on the way out. But the filters, the fans are embedded within the case. And if you were to look at it, picture like a PC tower, and then basically the build volume on the left-hand side or the side of it. And that's where the actual build is happening. But all the guts and the electronics are inside that PC tower. There's three fans, but what I've done is even taken into account the velocity of the air that's being extracted versus most people just put in fans, suck air out, and push it. But you would hear this whoosh, right, of, of air. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was actually speed up the velocity of the air coming in and then reduce it at the top so there's like a large funnel that narrows to the fans that are actually placed horizontally inside of the case. And then the fans, so they, the air actually speeds up velocity towards the fans, but then it funnels back out towards the bottom of the case. So it's, so it's almost indistinguishable where you were to put your hand next to it because you're reducing the air velocity. So what you're, but what you're doing is you're getting the intake of air really quickly and you're slowing it down, you're filtering it twice and you're pulling it back out. There would be no smell, no fumes, nothing. Um, onboard camera, and there would be two cameras. One camera is for the build volume, so you can actually take a look at it. And then there would be a camera that would be almost directly at the build plate, almost like one of those micro cameras, so you can take a look at it. Actually, how is the build going? And then I actually designed a laser system that actually takes a look across the build plate as it comes up. If, it, if the laser scans all the way across, it means the print failed. If the laser actually scans and then doesn't bounce back and hit something, it means that there's something there. And it means that the build must be going okay. Right. Wow, so that's it's, amazing. It, it, it's stuff like that. Um, automatic resin, uh, per, uh, automatic resin fill. Mm -hmm. And what I did actually, instead of having like a nozzle or something else, is the actual uh, vat that the resin's in. Is the vat would be three D printed out of titanium, and there's channels in the inside of that vat that actually channel the resin. So you just have one tube that plugs into the back, and then it actually looks at the level of the resin that's needed based on the slicer. And I've already talked to a, a company that does this. So in our slicing software, you know, it tells you you're going to use this much resin. It's going to be this number of slices. Well, why couldn't it just do the extra math and say, well, it's going to use this much resin per slice? If you thought about it, right? Pretty simple. It's just a yeah. little more of a calculation. So the whole idea is that that would only have as much resin as it absolutely needs to get started. And then as it raised up the, and all the sides, on all four sides, all of a sudden the resin would squirt in for the next layer that it came back down in. And then it would anticipate how much it's already used and then just squirt as needed. Wow, how long do you think uh, before you have you start having some prototypes ready on that? There's some more parts that I actually need to accumulate. So and there's some technologies in, this, in a sense that I still have to figure out. Mechanically, it's pretty easy. I've got the servo motors. Um, it's gonna be run on a Raspberry Pi. So it's not even going to be run on a, on a standard board um, that you'd find in printers now because I wanted the Wi-Fi capability, right? I don't want to get up and take an SD card. I just want to send it. I want it to be smart and tell me things, right? Um, also, too, is I have a 7-inch LCD display, a touchscreen display. I have for this unit is a 7-inch fully touch capacitive. It's not the resistive like you get on the yeah, wires now. I hate those. <laughs> yeah. So, so my thing is about quality too, right? So it's like everybody's used to touching their iPhone and touching their smartphone. I want the same type of experience and that you would get from that. So that's the screen that I acquired, right? So it's, it's getting all that stuff and saying, I'm building a printer that I would like to see. Commercially, do I want to bring it to market? Yeah. Um, would it be 20 grand? No. It might be, you know, maybe four to six, somewhere right around there. Um, but with all this stuff that's kind of readily available. And then support too. I've got a guy right now that was, he still is, matter of fact, he's got three FBM printers and he's building these intake tubes for a car. They're 14 inches long and four inches around. And he's like, I've got three or four FBM printers literally in his living room. And they're these big, massive commercial printers. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm got these things going all the time, but three of them are down right now. I have 52 items in the backlog of parts that have been ordered from people that I just can't facilitate the orders, right? So I, I did the math for him and said, well, if we, even if I had my 23 inch, I could literally print that for you because I can print it horizontally instead of vertically. And with the detail that he wants, I'm like, dude, I can print that for you in a matter of like nine hours. And then I can put on that one, I can put, it was like 
three or four of them that I could do at once. So he was like, when you get the printer done, I want to see, I want to know because I can basically get rid of these FBM printers and get the quality that I want. And that's the big thing too, is quality is the biggest thing, right? Is mm-hmm. some people print, but they're not concerned about the quality. They're just printing like the hobbyist. Mm-hmm. And, but I'm like, I, it's my reputation that's behind it. I want somebody to look at it and go, yeah, this is a quality part, right? This is like an injection molded part when they get it. Um, so it's like, I've got parts here that it's like, you can, you necessarily really can't see it, but in this is the mica powder and the mica powder gives it a sheen. Like it, it looks like a satin metal finish, right? So it's like, did I have to do that? No. Does it add any strength to it? No. Um, but it was, Hey, does it give it the appearance of being that quality part? Yeah. Cause why am I charging you? No. $38 for a part, for a little part this big. This did, part is, this part retail would be like 64 bucks each. Did you have any problems with the mica powder at all? Did you have to experiment with that? No. No? Just, no. Well, I would think some of the reflection on what layer by layer might affect the curing or something on it. But the, the only, it didn't, well, I didn't have any negative effect with the resin. What I did have to do is account for time. So I just oh, basically okay. looked at it and said, in the sense, what you're saying is I, I was like, all right, you know what? It's probably going to reflect some of the light. Mm-hmm. So let me increase the cure time. Let me increase the base from 60 to 80. And let me increase the per layer time from like 14 mm-hmm. to, I think it was like from 14 to like 20 or 21. So I increased the layer time intentionally right. before I ever even started. I was like, just let me give it a this, right? Because if that's too long or whatever, I'll back it down. But let me kind of go extreme at first. And it worked out. So oh, okay. I kind of took that into account and knowing ahead of time. And then with that, actually, hmm? with that mix, you didn't have to really worry about it being too brittle if you're if you're uh, overexposing it a little bit. Yeah. There's been times too, is like I've set stuff in the cure chamber and then did something with the family walked out and the next, the next morning come in and been sitting there curing for like 16 hours. Oh, geez. And I'm like, Oh, I baked this part. And I'm like, no nope, part's perfectly fine. Um, one other question I had on the, on the printer that you're developing, um, are you, obviously you're going to have to write your own firmware for that, right? Or have it, have somebody. Actually, no. Actually, no. There's firmware that already exists that you can go out there and get. Oh, okay. Custom, some custom pieces to that, yeah. And then what about the slicer? That come with that have an accompanying slicer too, as well with that? Yeah, because okay. it'll because it'll take the, the accompanying slicer will take into account the individual layers of the resin that's needed, plus or minus like one or two percent per layer that it would have to inject before the the, the vertical came down. Wow, that's awesome. The other, the other thing I'm looking at too is that I'm actually working directly with the manufacturer of the screens in China. So it's you know the, the guys that manufacture the screens for the Elegant Mars and for the Pro and for the Unicubic Pi. Mm-hmm. I know guys. I know those guys directly. As a matter of fact, is it this one? This is it. So this right here is really the first monochrome 2K replacement screen for the Mars and the Mars Pro. Oh, cool. But it's monochrome. Right. right? It doesn't it doesn't exist anywhere else, but I've got it in my hand. And to tell you what it's and this is with a with a backing on it per se just for shipping, but I mean it's you know it's a couple of millimeters thick. Right. Uh, and then you once you take this metal piece off with this where they left the tabs it's a millimeter. It's super thin. Um, but this is the first one that, that exists, this replacement screen. So this would take a, a Mars and make it from the color screen that's being used to a, to a 2K model, right? The problem is, is that the manufacturer, not the screen manufacturer, but the board manufacturer, which is the same with the Shitu from the Shitu box mm-hmm. software. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. The two Chinese companies didn't talk to each other. So Chi2 Box, or the name of the company is called CBD, makes the boards. And they also make the boards, the motherboards that are inside of the marks. The motherboard has what's called a MIPI out, or M-I-P-I out, which fits this little teeny connector. Um, which, 
which fits this little teeny connector right here. Okay, but this screen can't be driven natively from the motherboard. So you need this daughter board. So this uh, daughter board connects, has a connector to fit that little connector. But the best thing, here's the thing that cracks me up. This right here has a USB-C for power and has an HDMI for video in. The problem is the current motherboard doesn't have an extra USB-C out for power and doesn't have an HDMI out for power. Wow. So before COVID started, I started going back with the guys. I'm like, look, here's the market. You'll never sell these and bring these to the market, which is I've, I've got a list of over a thousand people, almost 1200 people that want these from me right now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you can't drive them. So I told the screen manufacturer, I'm like, you have no market. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you can't sell these because nobody can install them. And then I called, I called CBD and talked to everybody there. And I was like, you can't sell these boards to the mini, to the screen guys because nobody can install them. Because even though you're the manufacturer of both boards, you didn't make one talk to the other. <laughs> I'm like, does that make sense? So, and then there's a firmware upgrade that would be needed to, to drive them as well. So when I finally convinced them and got it across, I literally got a call the other day um, online and the guy was like, hey, Tony, good news. And I'm like, what? He goes, well, the board manufacturer has just made an adapter board to go from their main board to this adapter board, to this new driver board, to the new screen. Only thing we're waiting on now is the firmware. So I'm going to be able to bring this to market when it's ready to go. Because I've got, like I said, about a thousand people, almost 1,200 people now that are just waiting on it. Because they didn't want to buy a Saturn. Um, they didn't want to buy a Pro. But they don't, you know, they want to upgrade their existing Mars. And then you've got to replace the screen. And if they can replace it with a better screen, then great. That's what they want to do. What about the uh, LED array? Is there an upgrade for that? Yeah, there is an upgrade for the LED array. The LED array actually is just um, a little teeny small LED with like four of them on the inside. Mm -hmm. And it sits in the center with like a funnel, right? A mirror right. funnel. They do have a an array. The Pro has it. Yeah, you've probably seen it. Yeah. They, they buy it from the same place, which is this the manufacturer I'm talking to. And I actually tried to source a bigger one for the 23-inch screen. And they're like, nobody makes it. We, we don't even make it. I'm like, well, what would it talk for, for me to do? Like, I was thinking of doing a Kickstarter for the bigger printer and then getting the funds then doing it that way and having to make it. And if you've ever seen it, the lens array on the top yeah. doesn't have any separations. It looks like pillows, right? Yeah. That The mold just for that, not the lens array, but the mold to make the lens array is 20 grand. Uh. And I was like, I can't justify the cost because I can't necessarily see, I wouldn't want to put out a Kickstarter and put my name behind it and then not be able to deliver a product because it just wasn't the way that I wanted. People would be disappointed, right? So it kind of goes back to me again, right? It's like, unless a product meets my standards, I won't put my name on it or send it out the door, you know, just because it's me personally. All right. If you're going to do 3D printing, do something nobody else is doing. Anybody can print, right? Anybody can buy a printer for 300 bucks. Get some resin, slap it in there and go, yeah, I'm open for business and I'm going to print. And you're going to charge next to nothing, not make any money, not going to be happy and deal with the headaches of somebody calling you back up when the print doesn't come out the way they want. And they say, well, what'd you do wrong? Nothing. I printed your file. Well, then it's a he said, she said back and forth, right? So it's the other value added services and the printing is just the means to get the output of the other services up front, which is what should be important. Because then you can charge almost unlimited depending on what it is, right? You, yeah. With 3D printing, you can only charge so much because there's only, there's only so much value to be derived from that. But right. if I have a company call me up and they're just like, hey, we want this and this and this, and I start talking to them, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be 5K. And they're like, okay. Because then I can justify that 5K. I've seen some comments on some of the, uh, the groups where people are saying, you can't make money with 3D printing. Everybody's done it already. It's like... Well, There's an you, endless number of things you could do. <laughs> you you can't you can't well you can but you can't if you're just being like every other guy and just right. printing something. You got to come up with your own products. 
Yeah, you got to come up with your own stuff. You got to come up with your own kind of niche or whatever. And like I said, this isn't the day gig. I mean, you know, the day gig is, you know, I, I sit behind the same gray screen right. and design interfaces and workflows for enterprise applications. But, you know, if, if I'm not busy doing that, I mean, that honestly, the, the day gig probably takes me six hours a week, maybe. Right. Um, it's a full time salary, so it leaves me a lot of time to do other stuff. And so if a client calls me up and says, hey, whatever, I can spend three or four days revving on it. And then I, in a sense, I own the intellectual property. I own the IP and the design. They, I might exclusively license it to them. It might be, hey, we want exclusively to us, which I've done. Don't sell it to anybody else. Like a competitor. Okay. Now a competitor, that's hard because a competitor might call me and go, hey, we saw this or we know that you, you designed a part for these guys. Can you design us a similar part? I can design you a part that will do something similar, but I can't design you the exact same part, right? I have to make it different. Right. And either, and then I would, what that's really hard about is I charge them more. Because if you think about it, if I charge the first guy five grand to design the part, I didn't have any baseline, in a sense, competition to, to, to go off of, right? It was just, okay, it's five grand, here you go. If another company comes to me, company B, and says, hey, we saw company A's part, can you design it? If I've got an ex- exclusive agreement with company A, I can't design the same part for company B. So I'll charge them 7500 now because I have to then design over top of myself, right? Right. I can't design my own part. So now I have to think about what did I do on that last part and how can I make it different enough that company A is not going to be bent out of shape, but company B is going to get what they want, right? So it's like I'm the guy in the middle fighting against myself on the, as the sole designer of both parts. Right, and you want to make it better, but you don't want to tick off the other customer. Well, it's kind of it's kind of funny because like I want to make it better, but then the first time I design it, I put a lot of effort into it. So I'm like, I to me, I designed it perfectly the first time, right? And so it's like, yeah. I'm going to charge you more because now I have to then innovate on top of myself <laughs> to design a better part, right? So it's so it's kind of funny because I've had to do it a couple of times, and I'm like, you know, and sometimes they they call me out and they're like, well, hey, we know you charged that guy five grand, and I'm like, yeah, but and I explain to them just like that, yeah. Now I have to innovate on top of myself. I can't give you his part. So I have to then not think of what I did over here and design you something that gets you what you need, but doesn't infringe on what them because they built a competitive advantage, right? Right. And I've had to find big agreements too. Is hey, if you design part for A and you give it to B, we're going to sue you for a couple hundred grand. Right. You know, well, so there's indie and stuff that goes around as well. So um, we're going to have to have you come back and talk about the printer when you have something <laughs> when you have something working and then I know a lot of people are going to be interested in the the screen upgrade once you have that working that that'd be awesome to see too yeah the screen so the the new adapter board to go from our existing um, motherboard in the, in the current Mars Mars Pro um, any cubic photon kind of the standard printers and I actually know worldwide there's 600,000 of these printers that are in existence right now that doesn't include, the, that's not the new Saturn, the new bigger format, nothing above 8.9 inches, right? Anything that's like 5.5, 6 inches. Mm-hmm. I know there's 100,000 of those printers that are in the wild right now because I'm talking directly to the board manufacturer and i pulling teeth, but I'm like, how many of these printers are in the wild? Oh, there's 600,000. Oh, great. I see a big market, right? Yeah. The part is, is they want to charge me for an exclusive. Oh, if you want to be the exclusive distributor, then we're going to charge you an arm and a leg. Otherwise, now I'm competing against it, right? right? My my advantage is a lot of people in the U.S. like them in the U.S. that I have a U.S. number, that they can call me up if there's an issue or something like that. So, you know, I'll provide support and build a whole site around it and everything else. Um, and that's gonna that's called Resin 3. So there's a couple of Facebook groups. There's, there's some postings and it's just called Resin 3. So the whole idea is these screen upgrades, as well as I'm working with a company in Europe to come up with a custom formulation of resin, that people won't have to mix. That if you're doing functional parts, that it'll have that non-brittle, it'll be tough, but then it'll it'll have the capability of meeting 500 degrees Fahrenheit as a heat deflection. It would probably start melting it, you know, 400 somewhere right around there. You know, it'll deflect 500 temporarily. If you exposed it to 400 all the time, um, it probably start. It, it would deform, but it wouldn't turn into a block, right? So mm-hmm. it'll, it'll last. Um, but yeah, so resin three is kind of the brand that I kind of came up with, um, really quick that, and I, I purposely threw like a, um, a link out there for people to like, leave me your email address. And I purposely didn't push it really hard because what I didn't want to do is once again, is 
you've heard me say it a whole bunch of times, is reputation is everything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to sit there and throw it out there and then fail, right? Or, or these guys blow it up and be like, no, we can't do it, make it happen. Otherwise, I would just, I would send everybody an email, that entire list, and be like, hey, I tried, just couldn't pull it off. Mm-hmm. I'd get work with the manufacturers. Um, but I didn't want to throw over commit and under deliver, right? I'd rather, in a sense, totally under commit and then over deliver when it's available. Like you're the first person to even know that even those um, adapter boards have even been made. I haven't even told anybody else and put it out there publicly. Wow, that's um, great. I'm, wait, I'm just waiting on the firmware to actually be written by the main board manufacturer. Once that's ready to go, ironically enough, it's going to be me competing with them on who releases it to the market. Mm-hmm. They'll throw it out there globally. I have a curated list, which is my advantage, right? I've got a curated list of like 1,200 people that are, that are waiting for as well as the list is also the um, UV upgrades as well, um, and also the 4K screen that's available. All right, great. Then I'll uh, I'll post your information at the in the description of the video, and then people can go there to to get on the list and find out all the things you're doing. And we'll we'll have you back too to talk about that other stuff. Really cool. I'd be more than happy to. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us. Appreciate it. Hey, no problem. I mean, thanks for having me on, and thanks for the interview. It's great.